Greetings and salutations. I'm Dr. Art Fleischer from Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Departments of Radiology and OBGYN. It is my honor to present a discussion of new applications of contrast ultrasound, particularly microbubble ultrasound, and I hope this stimulates some thought and discussion of new applications of this very exciting modality. At the beginning, I would like to acknowledge the very significant impact that one of my mentors, great mentors, Dr. Barry Goldberg, and also Larry Waltrip uh, has made um, using this sonar world as a vehicle, but have the sonar world has made a difference in the health of individuals really all around the world. And I wanted to mention this. Thank you. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose, but I might have three others um, that are not financial. If you look at this picture, I'm really not an astronaut, though it's hard to believe, I think. But some people call me Spacey at times, but my first name really is not Kevin either. And this presentation I want to dedicate in memory of my mother um, because she always um, encouraged me to think big. And here's John Fitzgerald Kennedy um, describing his wish that the country be dedicated. As he said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they were, they are hard. And I think I put the challenge to everyone to think big. Um, my mother would have done that too. Objectives, uh, both the diagnostic and therapeutic applications of microbubbles. First, um, diagnostic part to look at tumor response, to use ultrasound as molecular imaging to label microbubbles to go to particular areas, um, to decrease collateral damage, for example, um, for oncologic treatment. Therapy, the microbubble can be used uh, for therapy and delivery of drugs through sonoporation, and uh, I will talk about this. Enhanced treatment of, for example, Alzheimer's or brain tumors that normally there's a blood-brain barrier which works very effectively. The microbubbles can be used to improve drug delivery, and this is very exciting. I want to also familiarize you with a new term, theranostics, which is a combination of diagnostics and therapy, because the border between diagnosis and therapy now is being blurred. Uh, so this is a new term. As I said, I'll talk about tumor response assessment with microbubbles, labeled microbubbles, and therapeutic applications. This is my research uh, support uh, thus far. I'm very appreciative of several NIH grants, several grants from the AIUM, uh, Discovery Grants. I'm appreciative of Philips Healthcare helping us out, and Bracco and Lentheus. Okay, firstly, let's get some concepts down concerning tumor angiogenesis. The picture on the left is a scanning electron micrograph of a few millimeter breast tumor. And as you can see, this breast tumor has multiple tiny vessels surrounding it. And it's the theory of Dr. Judah Folkman that for, in order for tumors to grow from maybe a few millimeters to a centimeter or so, they have to incite a new blood supply neoangiogenesis, and they do this through what's called vasogenic endothelial growth factor, VEGF. And what it produces is a tumor that has actually very irregular central blood flow. There's areas of necrosis that occur very early on, 
And we know that tumors have increased interstitial pressure because they don't have the typical ordered lymphatics that normal tissue has. Now, if we look at the vessel uh, process in tumor angiogenesis, again, I've referenced a beautiful article with these uh, diagrams. What happens first is that there's fenestration of the basement membrane surrounding the, the small capillary uh, endothelial cell. And then the fibroblasts come through this endothelial cell gap and they set up a scaffold for neovessels that eventually are, uh, are made patent in the center of the vessel and thus there is new blood supply to the tumor. This is a comparative scanning electron micrograph uh, from Peter Choki and his colleagues at the NIH. On the left, we see an artery going to an arteriole, going to a capillary, going to a, a small venous structure, going to a venule, and this is very organized hierarchy of vessels. On the right is a comparable scanning electron micrograph of a tumor. And as you can see, hopefully, the new blood vessels are very irregular in their caliber, very clustered, very abnormal. And if you're a red blood cell, just like going down a highway, you have an interstate going to a smaller road, going to a back road, etc very organized. Here, if you're a red blood cell, you just have a whole bunch of blind ending, crazy network of vessels. And of course, at least I think, this indicates why we see um, uh, increased washout phase, at least in some of the tumors that we see and have studied. This is a beautiful diagram from Scientific American, an article written by Dr. Jane from Harvard, who is an expert on uh, tumor angiogenesis. Um, and I want to make a few pertinent uh, comments. So diagrammatically, here's the tumor, and here are the blood vessels supplying this tumor. But tumors produce these tiny, irregular, blind-ending, chaotic-appearing vessels. Well, why is this important? Well, because in order to get the best chemotherapy and um, uh, trying to understand how to best treat lesions, we can understand that all these abnormal vessels, the concept of these abnormal vessels, have to be taken care of. And perhaps if we get rid of these vessels, we have a more efficient way of treating the tumor. Again, microscopically, tumor vessels are leaky, as shown in this diagram. They're very irregular. They're not hierarchical um, in, in nature. So the tumor microenvironment, we have dysfunctional vessels, which I've described, produce conditions of low oxygen, hypoxia, and high acidity. Well, why is this important? Because the ability to treat tumors, for example, in radiation, is related to their hypoxic or non-hypoxic state. Radiation in certain chemotherapies that require oxygen to kill are ineffective in tumors. This is important. Immune cells that might attack cancer cells cannot function in an acidic environment in the tumor without oxygen. Hypoxia causes changes to gene activity and promotes tumor cell migration in healthy tissues. The fluid backup, tumors tissue swells, and this is, it, 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 this is shown in the clinical world as uh, lymphedema, for example, causing painful symptoms. Fluid pressure drives tumor-generated proteins and cells toward healthy tissues into lymphatic vessels, increasing the chance of metastases. So if we kind of understand what is shown in this diagram, I think we understand a little bit about tumors and how to not only diagnose them, but potentially uh, treat them. This is just a 
funny slide, uh, Dr. Michelle Robin, who is chief of ultrasound in Birmingham, uh, three hours south of Nashville, uh, and I were walking at the World Federation meeting in Seoul, Korea, 19, in uh, 2006, and we came across this, and I said to my wife, I said, this looks like macro bubbles. We had just gotten out of session uh, concerning micro bubbles. So um, what were you interested in, uh, in micro bubbles? These are small structures, about a third the size of a red blood cell. Uh, here's an animation showing a capillary and the blue balls are uh, conceptually a micro bubble. Now, um, when we look at a slab of tissue, um, it would take a hundred vessels um, with blood flow to get a adequate Doppler uh, signal. But really in cancer, the action is at the capillary level, not at the larger vessel. So that if we could calculate the true perfusion defined as blood flow in ml per second over a particular volume, we could actually understand um, tumor dynamics a lot better. And when we look at the equation, which I'll show you in a minute, for perfusion, uh, there's an alpha and a beta. Well, by understanding what we're seeing uh, with microbubble perfusion, we can actually calculate these two parameters and thus come up with a estimation, a very close estimation, relative estimation of perfusion. Okay, the microbubbles are small. They're made up of a central gas surrounded by a lipid uh, shell. And their diameter is, one, is 2 to 15 microns, understanding a red blood cell is about 7 microns. And when exposed to ultrasound, they resonate, they oscillate. They, as you can see here from this diagram, they can go from 5 microns to 50 microns um, in their oscillation. It's this oscillation that produces a harmonic that allows us to image them relative to surrounding echoes. So our, um, our signal over, over noise is much better because these microbubbles uh, can be imaged with harmonics. This is a picture of the DFINITY microbubbles. Um, and as you can see, they're pretty homogeneous in size. And, and you can see them compared to the, micro, to the scale at the bottom, which is 5 microns. Now, this is a picture courtesy of Dr. Kasky and his colleagues at UC uh, Davis. And this is a picture, kind of an animation, kind of a neat animation of the microbubble oscillating and then breaking. So to estimate perfusion, as I mentioned, this is the um, formula that we're, we're um, looking at, the alpha and the beta. Now, to do accurate assessment of perfusion, one has to get the IV uh, ready in an infusion rather than a bolus injection and um, achieve a steady state, then increase your mechanical index, which basically breaks all the bubbles, and then you watch the reperfusion, and you can calculate the beta from the slope of this line and the, I'm sorry, the alpha from the slope of the line and the beta from its height, and you can come up with a number that roughly quantitates perfusion. So let's look at the first new application, that is tumor response. Um, there's a group of physicians in France at their cancer hospitals, uh, led by Dr. Nancy LaSalle. This was first um, very nicely detailed in an article in Radiology in 2011, where they studied patients with hepatocellular carcinoma and their response to anti-angiogenic treatment. And she found that the waveforms and an analysis that I went over were quite predictive of tumor response and in cancer, what's called the progression-free interval, and in fact, 
overall survival. So the microbubble perfusion assessment uh, does correlate to both short-term and long-term tumor response. A similar study was reported by Williams uh, looking at the tumor response of microbubbles, a tumor response to, to anti-angiogenic uh, agents in renal cell carcinomas. And he found that the findings on microbubble perfusion actually predicted tumor response much earlier than changes in tumor size, which is the resist category used for CT assessment of tumor um, response. There's uh, other papers that have used this, and I've uh, included them here. There's a recent paper on perfusion changes in cervical carcinoma with, with um, successful anti, uh, with oncologic treatment. And of course, there's also some very nice papers describing this technique for preclinical studies. For example, if you're going to study whether or not a oncologic drug is going to be effective, um, it's important to know that. And these are preclinical, i.e. experimental or animal studies that have reported the use of a particular labeled microbubble um, to assess this. Now, I want to just show you our very limited, uh, admittedly so, uh, clinical experience with a drug that was made as an anti-angiogenic treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma. These patients had failed standard hepatocellular carcinoma uh, chemotherapy and treatment. So let's look at these uh, patients. And I must acknowledge Dr. Andre Lishak my colleague who did uh, the vast majority of this work. What we have here is a 3D color Doppler image of a patient that has a hepatocellular carcinoma. We see this in the long axis, for example, in the orthogonal plane, coronal plane, and with 3D color Doppler. This is pre-treatment. The volume was calculated at 19 cubic centimeters. Now, at, we study these patients at 15 days post-treatment. I think you can appreciate that this tumor um, has really not changed in, in size. Now, I'm showing the video of, at day zero, the tumor. And this is the fundamental image and the harmonic image. And I'm going to show this to you one more time. So we start at the echogenic uh, appearance of breaking all the bubbles and we put a region of interest here and our software is doing the the work c calculating the alpha and the beta. This is the same patient, same mass at 15 days post administration of drug and obviously it doesn't really look like much difference to the eye but when we calculate the bolus perfusion, okay, um, this is intensity over time. The blue line is the pretreatment um, diagram. The red is the post-treatment at 15 days. You can see there's a marked decrease in perfusion. If we do our destruction reperfusion uh, uh, sequence, you, again, you see that even though the, the mass has not changed in size, um, this is indication of a responder. And here's the side-by-side -side graphs and the side-by-side -side comparison of the volume, the contrast enhancement in dB, decibels, microvascular density, decibels, and the blood velocity. So this is a good responder. This is another patient that has a hepatocellular carcinoma being treated by uh, anti-angiogenic treatment. Here's the baseline 3D images. This is at day 15. The volume has not changed. But let's look at the video. The video, again, if we had to do this just by eyeballing it, doesn't look like a big difference. This is at the um, baseline. And now um, at day 15, this 
this tumor here. So visually it doesn't look like much difference, but let's look at the graphs. Here the yellow is pretreatment and the red is at day 15. You can see a nice decrease in blood flow or perfusion and a similar decrease in perfusion on the destruction perfusion sequence. And here's the side-by-side -side comparisons using um, a different color scheme, but the information is very similar. What does a poor responder look like? And here's, a, again, an HCC right here. This is after the initial injection and the killing of the microbubbles with high mechanical index. And here we see perhaps a difference in side-by-side -side perfusion. Obviously this has to be quantitated using offline analysis. And here we have our bolus, and this is pretreatment, post-treatment. I'm sorry, this is pretreatment and then post-treatment. And you can see that the post-treatment is actually more flow than the pretreatment. Pretreatment, post-treatment, poor responder. And if we quantitate in this, in this fashion, our three cases, we see there's a significant difference in the non-responder. Obviously, this has to be tested in larger series, but if you look at the data from Lucel in France, where it's used clinically every day, multiple patients, this looks very promising. So, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. What defines a good, poor, or fair response? And according to Dr. Lasso, the area under the curve, the AUC, if there's a 40% reduction, that is a good responder. How does this correlate with clinical response and survival? Yes, in Dr. Lasso's very large series, it does. How about multiple lesions? Which one to select? We don't really know. How, how about the effect of areas of necrosis? Another question to be examined. Does the treatment decrease interstitial pressures and improve hypoxic areas? At least theoretically, it's possible. Okay, some other applications of microbubbles that have been recently reported. Sonoporation, that is use of microbubbles to get drug across that gap junction, has been utilized in theory in patients with pancreatic cancer, which we know is a very deadly disease. The typical diagnosis to uh, uh, demise uh, time is three to five months. Uh, so anything that could improve would be great. And in a very small series of 10 patients, in Bergen, Norway, they report that their patients that had microbubble administered uh, actually survived up to a year. Very exciting. How about in pediatric uh, patients that unfortunately have been refractive to typical chemotherapy? This work being done by Beth McCarvel from St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis. It seems that Memphis always gets confused with Nashville. Memphis is where Elvis lived. Uh, it's in the west part of the state, about two hours west of Nashville. Anyway, um, she reported that the contrast enhanced ultrasound predicted which patients would be responsive to chemotherapy in her series of 13 unfortunate uh, children with advanced cancer. Um, there is, has been discussion of the use of contrast-enhanced ultrasound and, in fact, shear wave elastography in finding uh, cancer foci in the prostate. Um, this was described in Urology Today in September. So the future opportunities for microbubbles, and this, of course, uh, goes into the area of treatment. We have a diagram of a microbubble with the lipid and a targeting lichen on the end. Um, it could theoretically be told to go to areas where there's a complementary uh, ligand. So we can quantitate perfusion. We can monitor angiogenesis. As we know, 
the tumors grow where there are blood vessels that are rapidly growing. Um, we could target drug therapy theoretically and we can enhance uh, gene therapy. This is a diagram courtesy of Evan Unger from Arizona um, and the IMA, IMA RX um, uh, company. So what are we doing? This is a diagram showing the uh, typical vessel, endothelial cell, and an antibody to VEGF that is, that is hanging off the luminal side of these cells. Now, when we inject a contrast that has these, uh, a ligand, a microbubble uh, that has a ligand attached to it, we let it flow, and where there is a match, uh, the microbubble stays. Otherwise, it, there, there is flow in the, um, the, the microbubbles just pass through the blood supply. At seven minutes, only the blood-bound protein, uh, the VEGF, for example, um, microbubbles remains. This is shown electron microscopy and with optical image from this group, um, and we can see the red dots, in fact, are microbubbles in vessels that are neoplastic. Diagrammatically, uh, this is what goes on. Um, here's a picture of an endothelial uh, cell in a tumor uh, with the, um, my, the antibody, the um, VEGF receptor, and when there is um, the, the, when there is VEGF finds this receptor, uh, angiogenesis can continue. However, if there's blockage, this theoretically would block tumor growth. This is a diagram that Andre made now several years ago of the VEGF receptor, the second VEGF receptor. Here's the microbubble. The so-called glue part of it is the biotin strep avidin, and this is the anti-VEGF2 to show kind of the concepts of molecular imaging. And this is a diagram, maybe a fancier diagram. Of course, it costs us much more money than the one that Andre uh, did himself. So how do we look for this labeled uh, imaging using microbubbles? We inject, this is in a mouse model, and we uh, have a total a signal here. And at a t point in time further out, we use high mechanical index and we destroy the bubbles. Well, the bubbles that are still attached are the bubbles that uh, we're interested in. Here is a picture from a Vivison, Vivisonics image. These are millimeters, not centimeters. This is a, a tumor that's implanted in the thigh that Andre did, uh, and you can see uh, some echoes, but the green actually uh, shows where the vessels inside of this tiny tumor uh, are. And this is, um, again, with a very high frequency uh, scanner. So uh, this is another picture of um, the bubbles coming in, producing the, the image in green of the areas of tumor vessels. And so Andre and his uh, colleagues um, several years ago uh, showed that there was a difference in tumors with very high VEGF and tumors that have relatively low VEGF. And this is written up in Journal of Ultrasound in Medicine. So t again, the concept that the targeted microbubble can perhaps even contain medication in its center, go to the area of the tumor, uh, so-called magic bullet, uh, increase mechanical index, break the bubble, and deliver the bubble into the tumor in interstitium. This is a, a very nice uh, picture of such a microbubble where the center is gas. And of course, there's thought about replacing what's in the center, what we use as a gas. Um, perfluorocarbon is used in most microbubbles, um, a sulfur compound as well. Uh, maybe if we could use oxygen 
uh, deliver more oxygen to the tumor, we could decrease, um, well, increase its radiation uh, sensitivity, for example. And this is a study that is ongoing, a discovery study at our place. Um, and we're testing locally delivering the chemotherapy agent to the xenograft and applying radiation and looking at differences in, in uh, animals where the tumor had, in fact, the microbubbles and those where there was no microbubbles. So the concept is to locally enhance uh, oxygen and make it more radiosensitive. This is also work done by Dr. Charles Kasky at our Vanderbilt Imaging Institute. Uh, diagrammatically, what, what goes on, this is an endothelial cell uh, with the vascular gaps. Here's a microbubble. When the ultrasound is turned on, the microbubble swells, it oscillates asymmetrically, and then when it breaks, it forces a field, a, a jet of fluid to go across the gap junctions. And this is kind of pictures, neat pictures of what occurs microscopically when the bubble enlarges and when it breaks, it produces these little eddy currents. Well, think about it. If you have drug in the lumen of the vessel and you're trying to get it to the interstitium, the microbubbles can enhance that. This was a study that he did and his group at um, University of, of California at Davis um, where they had tumors in, in mice and they let them grow, and at, day, at week three, they uh, treated them with the microbubbles. And normally, these tumors would just continue to grow. But he observed, and others, that in some of the tumors, there was a rapid decrease in the perfusion. And so, theoretically, what the microbubbles are doing is they're helping to deliver drug across the blood-brain barrier. Very exciting work. Well, another concept that is very exciting is uh, the use of microbubbles to get antibodies to these amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease to enhance the transport of the antibodies from the vessel lumen out into the interstitium across the blood-brain barrier to attack these deposits of amyloid characteristic of the abnormality seen in, in Alzheimer's. Admittedly, this is in a mouse uh, model, but it looks extremely exciting that the microbubbles can enhance um, drug delivery across these gap junctions. This is a group from Brisbane, Australia. So in conclusion, I would like to just uh, have you understand this and give it give much thought to it that contrast enhanced ultrasound we know is excellent for the differential diagnosis of liver lesions renal lesions and ovarian masses um, but the microbubble ultrasound combination has potential to assess tumor response and this in init initial phases seems to be better than looking for changes in size and tumor on CT or MR or possibly PET, we don't know. There's a potential to enhance specifically targeted therapy. And this term is called uh, theranostics, a combination of diagnosis and therapy. And there's a potential for using microbubbles. I didn't describe this, but for breaking up of blood clot. And I did basically mention the use of microbubbles to attack, to let uh, antibodies go across the blood-brain barrier to attack the amyloid in Alzheimer's disease. I want to thank my colleagues and acknowledge them, uh, Charles Kasky, um, Vanderbilt Imaging Institute, Dr. Andre Lischach, who is now at Jefferson, but did some pioneering work when he was at Vanderbilt, and I'm fortunate and continuing to collaborate with him. 
and the group at Jefferson, um, the various companies that have supplied the microbubbles and software and drug in one case. I want to acknowledge our media specialist, uh, John Bobbitt, and I want to thank the directors of these areas, Dr. John Gore, who's the director of the Vanderbilt Imaging Science, Dr. Reed Omri, who is chairman of the Department of Radiology. Uh, they set up an environment where someone who is primarily a clinical person can be involved in clinical research. And thank you for listening, and I hope this presentation is both informative and thought-provoking. Thank you.